Welcome back to the show, everybody. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen and those in between, uh, today we will be talking about how controversial the Olympics has already become. Um, it's been an interesting road so far, and we're going to get into three main topics. One, we're going to talk about the, in, the opening ceremony, which, again, very controversial. We're going to talk about the trans question, which I think will take up most of this video, given that there is so much mis misinformation, misconstructions, and just all around an uneasy feeling about it. And number three, we're going to talk about Yusuf Dikrich, who, and if I pronounce that wrong, if you're Turkish, please leave a comment. But we'll talk about him because, let's be honest, since when has the second place ever been so famous? We'll get to that on this show. Thank you. Oh, good, you stayed. Thank you. As I said, we're going to start off with my interpretation of the opening ceremony. So for those who didn't know or have not seen it, uh, the Olympics in France opened up with a rather promiscuous and very sexualized uh, dance choreography in which they even make fun of the Last Supper. And I hear, I know some people are out there saying, well, it's actually supposed to be making fun of, or it's, it's supposed to represent Dionysus and the great feast that he used to have as a god, Greek god, I should say, and... That's who the blue character, that, that blue drag queen looking person in the opening ceremony was sitting on the table. But that's, I'm not as worried about that. Like, here in the last 20, here in the last 10 years, open sexuality and sexuality within our media has been way, way big. So it does, that does not surprise me at all. But what surprises me is the imagery of what was going on in the background. So before Dionysus gets up and does his little dance where he sings about sexuality, he sings about being naked, and which if you read the French, that is what he is singing about. The thing behind him, what the table he's sitting on is a bunch of queer drag queens representing the Last Supper. And this isn't me saying that. This is something that the media has gotten a hold of and ran with, and there's there's two sides of the coin here. Some people are saying that it is Dionysus' Supper and that that is what it's supposed to represent and it's supposed to represent inclusion and all that. But even the Olympic media team came out and said, sorry that our portrayal of the Last Supper was insulting to Christians. What do you think it was going to do? But we'll get more to that later. The, um, the, the problem here is that they purposefully, and I think kind of, and I don't even think they meant not to inf insult Christianity. Christianity is one of the few religions in the world that is allowed to be openly mocked. I'm a, I'm a strong Catholic. I am, I consider myself a soldier of Christ. Like that's the whole point of confirmation of Catholics in school. And I went through confirmation and I will defend my faith to the end. But it's amazing to me on social media how many Christians saw this as a, you know, I think we're just being too, too close-minded about it. We're being too um, judgmental. God is the only one that's supposed to judge. Yes, God is supposed to be the only one that judge. But when you have trans, uh, I'm not even going to say trans because I don't know that for a fact. Dra they were definitely drag queens that were on the stage that were talking about like they were doing this portrayal and this dance that was obviously making fun of Christ and the Last Supper like there is no way to sugarcoat it and the fact that they use drag queens just digs the knife in a little bit deeper It'd be one thing if it was like I understand in the modern world that everybody has to have DEI and I understand that there's always going to be a A hint of that underneath things. It'd be one thing if it was all women. It'd be one thing if it was all people of color. But this was drag queens and purposefully like queer people. And to fact, the girl that sat in the center, I don't know her name, I just know what I've researched. 
the girl in the center with the halo over her head, mind you, and with her hands going like this, if you look closely on her arm, her tattoo on this side, I believe, it is a it is a goat head with a with a pentagram on it, surrounded in black. A common common piece of media for satanic ritual, satanic uh, worship, satanic uh, alliance, I should say. And I know I have a fair fair amount of friends that are in the LGBTQ community, and I do not have a problem with them because because mo- they are. They are the LGBT in the center. They, they, they try not to be political. They try not to. And for the most part, most of them just want to be left alone. They are what I call 20, 2008 LGBTQ. Whereas we just want to be accepted. We want to be open and not be judged. Which is fine with me. I don't care who you sleep with. I don't care what your fetishes are in the bedroom. I do care, however, when a global network goes out of their way to make a a statement about it using your sexuality to do so. So that is my problem with that. And I think we all thought that was weird and messed up, but I think from there we can go and hope that it was not too bad. So, And my last point on this, we're going to talk about how the world reacted to it. Not just my reaction, because you uh, you just heard my reaction to it, but the world's reaction. And the, the worship that some people have to this new ideology of, well, we have to let them be who they are. Correct. And... God loves everybody. I'm not going to deny that. It's jo- it's God's job to love and judge as he deems fit. All right? It's not my job to say, "Hey, this person's living their life wrong." Hey, it's not it's not like religious to do that, but I understand that not everybody has my same faith. As much as I wish everybody was Catholic, as much as I wish everybody would take the Eucharist, accept God as their own whatever. That's not the world we live in. Unfortunately, we live in a world where this type of behavior and this type of, like, people almost worship, and I don't say that lightly, people almost worship their own sexualities nowadays. And that is far from okay. Because something like that is supposed to be behind closed doors. It's not everybody's business what you do in the bedroom. It's not, like, I mean, hell, Two years ago, there was issues about Drag Queen Story Hour, where people were allowing drag queens to come in and read to kids. And we have drag queens out here saying that, on on radio, on the TV, saying, well, if you won't accept us, your kids will, which doesn't help the, the, the like, you're not helping your cause by saying, oh, I'm going to be a guy dressed as a girl reading to a bunch of kids. No. That does not help the image that you guys are trying to portray. If you guys are trying to just be, we just want to be accepted. We want to be, we want to be part of society. That does not help the stigma that you are fighting. So leave the drag queens to the, the pub nights. Leave the drag queen idea to the adult audience. There are kids that watch the Olympics. Okay, and there's nothing more confusing than trying to explain to my 13-year-old sister why a woman, why a girl with boobs has a beard. And that, that, that's not something they, a 13-year-old or even younger needs to have questions in their head. They have a, they've got enough going on. You know, they've got dragons to slay outside. They've got Minecraft to get back to on their Xboxes, Playstations. You know, that's that's not something that a kid of that age should be worried about. And I think the media did a good job of gaslighting that this was a problem. Because even though you can sit there and say, yes, this is a act of a Greek Greek festival where Dionysus is sitting in the center of the table and doing his flight, flight, uh, sexual dance for an audience of everybody... You can also sit there and say that 
it's not right. It, it, it's not. And it's, it's just, once again, how they're trying to shove sexuality down the throats of us normal people just being that. And like, like I said earlier, the media did a good job of exposing that because a lot of, a lot of the uh, defenders of this were coming out saying, well, it's not making fun of Christianity. It's a Greek fort festival and it's going to be okay. Okay, if it was just that, maybe. Maybe it would be okay, but we'll never know because even the Olympic team had to come out and, and apologize. And it was a very, it was a very Baptist style apology for pretty much saying, well, if we offended you, or I'm sorry you don't accept us, or I'm sorry that's not accepting to you. It was a very, it was a very backhanded apology. And that is very not okay. Um, they should have never done it to begin with, and they should have kept the opening ceremony in traditional ways as they've done, where nations, bands come out and play, where you had a national pride. There was no national pride in that festival. It was a sexuality, it was a, it was a pride parade, but for, sexual, for sexuality, which, as I said before, not a good look. On the note of the LGBTQ being involved in the Olympics, we're moving on to our next topic, which is the trans question in the Olympics. Now, before I get started, I do want to come out and say, both the boxer, both the, both the fighters that are being accused of this are, Jeanette, are, were born female. There's a lot of misconception about that. They are born female. However, they are the true examples of intersex or of unisex. They are that 0.005% of the population of women who are born with, with higher testosterone in their system that the trans community tries to say is normal. Being an outlier, does, there's a reason outliers exist. As an outlier, there are, that does bring up certain questions, that does bring up certain attitudes. And this isn't the first trans issue we've had in the Olympics. In, in, um, in 2020, we had a lifter, a power lifter, who broke all the female rep records, and she wasn't, and he wasn't female. He was a actual, legit, transgender weightlifter who came in, said he was female, and he proceeded to crush the dreams of every female powerlifter that was there and broke all the records to where now the problem is no one's going to be able to break those records because a man entered, a genetic man entered a genetic female competition and uh, beat the competition to the point to where none of those records are going to be broken unless another trans woman, a man, enters the fray and breaks those records. It's unfortunate, it really is. And that was the start of the trans question in Olympics. Now, going to Amin Khalif and Ying Yantin, again, forgive my pronunciation, I practice these pronunciations over and over again, I, could, I don't know if I'm getting them right or not. People who are accusing Amin Khalif, 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 of being uh, transgender need to do more research because she's from the country of Algiers, which it is illegal to be transgender. It's illegal to go through those procedures. And, but here's where it gets icky. This isn't the first time she's caused controversy. She genetically has more XY chromosomes in her system than XX, which would technically on paper make her have to compete with men which is not fair to her because there are other things that's not gonna help her in that case. But at the same time, as the fight with her, her Italian uh, opponent suggested, it's not exactly a fair fight for women either because some, it's scientifically proven that the XY chromosome will allow you to be more, more athletic, have more stamina, be stronger in general, because it is a because of the genetics of the XY chromosome and the introduction of testosterone into your system, and she has had issues in the past where she's had she's lost medals. She has uh, she's failed testosterone tests going into other boxer uh, other boxing matches, global boxing matches, 
and I don't know how, I honestly, I don't know how to, there is no good way to test this one without controversy. You could say, well, she has all the female genitalia, like correct female genitalia. It's not like they were surgeries, they were anything like that. So she can compete. Okay, cool. But if you flip the coin on the other side, she has all the thanima and all the strength of a soy boy man. A man who is like a beta or, you know, someone who is not in that like normal masculine side. So uh, that's causing all kinds of controversy. I don't know how to, there is no good solution that comes to my mind on, on this. And the same question goes for Yin Yu Tang, which again, if I mispronounce that, I'm sorry. Lin Yu Tang is honestly, I haven't done much research on it. The Lin Yu Tang issue is that there is no, she, she is having the same issues as Amin Khalif. It's not a good thing. It's, we are trying to, I mean, there's all kinds of things that could lead to this. Like ever since the eighties, they've been putting more tests that like the fact of the chemicals in the food, the chemicals in, in the water to help the preservatives. Like it, we're starting to see the mainstream effects of that because I don't, I hate to quote Alex Jones. I'm not a fan of Alex Jones, but the chemicals in the water are turning the frogs gay because the chemicals, and he's not wrong. The way he said it is wrong. The lack of science in which he used to purvey that is wrong, but he's not wrong in the fact that the chemicals over long periods of time are going to have genetic effects on human beings. And we're seeing this with the, the closing of the sexes is the way I would word it. The, you're seeing people start coming out more trans because they either they feel like they're, they're not masculine enough or in the reverse effect, you have women coming out as men because they don't feel feminine enough. And that all good, and on, in my honest opinion, that goes down to the food that we eat, the preservatives that we eat, the, the chemicals. It's not, that was the tip. Now we're looking at the shaft, okay? This is where shit's getting real and we need to figure out, okay, why is this happening? how do we pursue it going forward because especially in the olympics where all you have to do is check a box saying male or female or open that's an, that's something i found out is in the men competition there is a thing called open which means that you can compete as a male or a female it does it's which is to me especially in something as glorified and as dignified as the olympics should be that is something that needs to be more honed in, especially nowadays. We have we have the science to do chromosome tests within an hour. Like send them to the doctor, get a chromosome test, and if they if they don't meet the ma the median standard, they can't compete. That's that's how it should be, and it's unfortunate that, like I feel bad for Amin Khalif, I feel bad for Ying Lin Ying Ting because they're getting all kinds of open backlash from even people like, unfortunately, most of the heat's coming from my side of the aisle that we've had to battle this transgender question in sports with Leah Thomas, um, men acting as women to go into women's bathrooms. Like here in America, the lens on that has become so scrutinized that in other countries, it may not be a problem, but here it's a problem. And the right wing media, which unfortunately I listen to, and I've actually had to go out and do outside research of that, has misconstrued all of this. Like, it's not as simple as, oh my God, a man hit a woman and it's okay because she's got boxing gloves on. That's how it looks to us in America. But if you read into it, you do the more research, it's a little bit more complicated than that. And as I said earlier, I, I presented this a, a possible solution, but what do we, where do we go from here? And that's a good question. Next, in the third and final thing, we're actually going to talk about something a little more lighthearted, a little bit more um, in my wheel wheelhouse. As as you all know, I do videos on guns. I do videos on 
military history, firearms history, and it's not, not necessarily history making, but it's definitely an interesting story. So Yusuf Durkic, the Turkish shooter, or the Turkish, one of the members of the Turkish shooting team took silver in this past week's shooting, shooting, pistol shooting um, competition. But what he's creating so much controversy over is the fact that you had all these other shooters there with fancy equipment, fancy, uh, which I, to be fair, I don't know where some of these people come up with their shooting stances. Here in America, you're pretty much taught from the age of 13 a proper shooting stance. And I have never seen one in the Olympics. However, the closest that I saw the, to what we train to is Yusuf Dirkrich, where he's just sitting there raises his gun, both eyes open, which I know that some people don't aren't a fan of that because it, it creates a double vision, but I know a lot of people that says that enhances your ability to shoot. And he, he had a, in my opinion, he had a really good stance, hand in pocket and all. And that's what's turning this world, flipping this world over is because this guy literally looked like he just got done shopping at the Costco and was like, oh, I'm gonna go shoot, I'm gonna go shoot at the Olympics. And he won. Well, he didn't win. He came in silver, which, but he's winning in the social in the social aspect because this guy's getting more radio time, more TV time than anybody else, any other shooter in the Olympics, and so we're gonna talk a little bit more about him. He, um, from everything I could find, he he started his he started his hobby of shooting after him and his ex wife got into an argument. Which it's funny when. It's funny to the type of anger that women can drive you to. It really is. Um, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse. But uh, in his case, it won him a silver medal. So he started his, his hobby of shooting after getting divorced and after a series of just, he, he needed an outlet for his anger against his ex-wife, which range therapy is a real thing. Going to the range, popping off a couple of rounds does help reduce stress, reduce anxiety, because it's like, it's a, it's a good, healthy way to get your anger out. And I, I applaud him for actually coming out and saying that. And the fact that he did this without any specialized equipment, without any um, lenses, like all the other shooters had, they are, it is very spectacular to me. He was able to Play silver without any fan. Like all he had on was his his prescription glasses, the ear protection that he probably got off the airport, got in the airport, because it's just basic. I don't even like even me as a as a shooter. I don't even use basic foam um, earplugs anymore to shoot. I use uh, a set of Walker uh, ear protection. And he goes out there and smokes all these other people, including America, by the way, which America, we really like, we are the gun capital of the world and we placed fourth in the shooting Olympics. That's embarrassing. I know, I know guys personally, even, possibly me even included that could shoot, that had better stances, better performance than any of these other guys shooting. And they're, and they shoot with big boy, big boy calipers. We're talking seven, six, two by 30. 39 we're talking about uh lever actions that shoot 44 magnum we're talking about people that shoot uh 30-06 and they could shoot way better than these people that are at the olympics that are shooting 17 caliber or 22 caliber pellets like they're not actually shooting bullets at these things they're actually shooting um uh they're, they're modified air rifles which anybody that shot a big boy caliber like the ones i just mentioned will know that once you've shot those accurately, you can shoot a pea shooter like that without any hesitation. Now that there is some drawbacks, if you were outside and a wind picked it up, or if you had uh, elevation issues, yeah, you're gonna have some different, differential uh, range and target. But in the Olympics, you shoot indoor 17 caliber or 22 caliber pellets from an air rifle. These should not be hard shots to make. Maybe we do this on purpose. Maybe the United States purposely does not send our best to hide our ability to shoot. Because if, if we took some, like even some of the other YouTubers out there, I know, if we took them and, and sponsored them into the Olympics, 
maybe we would win some medals in that. But we can't because we're already the world's capital of the guns. It would look, it would make the joke even worse that all Americans, the Americans do is shoot and eat bacon, which is not a bad thing. As an American, I'm proud to have that stigma. But at the same time, I can understand how in politics that looks bad. And going back to Yusuf, just the world's reaction to this poor guy is insane. Like, they're all calling him a uh, hidden hitman, a, um, a John Wick of the real world. Because shortly after shooting in the Olympics, he went back home and he posted a couple, video, a couple pictures of him with his cat. I have cats, as you just saw. If anything happened to my cats with my skill level that I have... I probably would become the next John Wick. I would only hate to see what this guy would do because he's a, he, he's, a, he's an Olympic gold medalist now in firearm shooting. It's, and it's, the memes are perfect. I wish I had time to find them all, post them up wherever I can, but the, the amount of memory and the amount of applause this guy is getting warms my heart because it takes all the, it takes the last two things I talked about and it kind of brings it back to, okay, maybe there is some commonality between the, the common man and the Olympics. Maybe it's not all DEI. Because, first of all, this guy, a white, middle-aged dude, performed pretty well. And I'm sure, the, I'm sure the DEI hordes out there are not happy with that, but it's a fact. The, this guy was able to go out, hand in pocket, just raise his pistol, Focus and fire. That's all it takes to be a good shot. Focus, determination, and, com and comfort in knowing that you can make the shot. I, I, I tell people all the time, I don't care what your stance is. I don't care how bad, how poor. Obviously, in the Olympics, it doesn't matter because the girl who took the medal had an absolutely atrocious stance by all of American teachings, like USCCA, which, if you like USCCA, now's a good time to add my sponsor. So USCCA is a, uh, they stand for United States Concealed Carry Association. They are a type of casualty insurance that helps people if and, if and when something happens involving a firearm. But they also offer training courses because... You can have a firearm, you can have the Gucciest firearm in the world, you can have an Olympic level pistol and still suck. I know guys with Geisel rifles, with Hector and Kook rifles that, yeah, they bought these Gucci guns, but that does not matter without training. So if, you like, if you're interested in, in bettering your stance and bettering your, your, your performance as a shooter, I would suggest joining USCCA, get the insurance coverage because honestly, we live in a world where the lawyers are out to get people who own firearms. It's political. It's a political thing. It'll get them the headlines. It'll get them promoted. Having USCCA in your corner during that would be helpful. That's why if you click the link below in the comment section or in the description, um, it'll show you. Uh, it'll send you to a link to give you a couple steps of what to do if you if and when you've been involved in a shooting. All right. And with that said, thank you for watching. Watch your six and have a good day. See you guys next time.